I'm Jean Vale, and I'm going to have the fun of reading with you two short stories by O. Henry. I enjoy his story so much because he loves to play with the language, and he manages to drop in some words that I've never heard before, and I must admit that in the first story there are three words that I actually had to look up because they were unfamiliar to me, and I don't think I'm going to be start using them in my vocabulary every day. Perhaps you'll recognize when I come across them. There is one day that is ours. This is called Two Thanksgiving Day Gentlemen. There is one day that is ours. There is one day when all we Americans, who are not self-made, go back to the old home to eat saleratus biscuits and marvel how much nearer to the porch the old pump looks than it used to. Bless the day. President Roosevelt gives it to us. We hear some talk of the Puritans, but don't just remember who they were. Bet we can lick them anyhow if they try to land again. Plymouth Rocks? <laughs> well, that sounds more familiar. Lots of us have had to come down to hens since the Turkey Trust got its work in. But somebody in Washington is leaking out advanced information about these Thanksgiving proclamations. The big city east of the Cranberry Bogs has made Thanksgiving Day an institution. The last Thursday in November is the only day in the year on which it recognizes the part of America lying across the ferries. It is the one day that is purely American. Yes, a day of celebration, exclusively American. And now for the story, which is to prove to you that we have traditions on this side of the ocean that are becoming older at a much rapider rate than those of the English are, thanks to our get up and enterprise. Stuffy Pete took the seat on the third bench to the right as you enter Union Square from the east at the walk opposite the fountain. Every Thanksgiving day for nine years he had taken his seat there promptly at one o'clock. For every time he had done so, things had happened to him. Charles Dickensy things that swelled the waistcoat above his heart and equally on the other side. But today, Stuffy Pete's appearance at the annual trysting place seemed to have been rather the result of habit than of the yearly hunger, which, as the philanthropists seem to think, afflicts the poor at such extended intervals. Certainly, Pete was not hungry. He had just come from a feast that had left him of his powers, barely those of respiration and locomotion. His eyes were like two pale gooseberries, firmly embedded in a swollen and gravy-smeared mask of putty. His breath came in short wheezes. A senatorial roll of adipose tissue denied a fashionable set to his upturned coat collar. Buttons had been sewn upon his clothes by kind salvation fingers a week before, flew like popcorn, strewing the earth around him. Ragged he was, with a split shirt front open to the wishbone, but the November breeze carrying fine snowflakes brought him only a grateful coolness. For Stuffy Pete was overcharged with the caloric produced by a super bountiful dinner, beginning with oysters and ending with plum pudding, and including, it seemed to him, all the roast turkey and baked potatoes and chicken salad and squash pie 
and ice cream in the world. Wherefore he sat, gorged, and gazed upon the world with after-dinner contempt. The meal had been an unexpected one. He was passing a red brick mansion near the beginning of Fifth Avenue in which lived two old ladies of ancient family and reverence for traditions. They even denied the existence of New York and believed that Thanksgiving Day was declared solely for Washington Square. One of their traditional habits was to station a servant at the postern gate with orders to admit the first hungry wayfarer that came along after the hour of noon had struck and banquet him to a finish. Stuffy Pete happened to pass by on his way to the park and the seneschals gathered gathered him in and upheld the custom of the castle. After Stuffy Pete had gazed straight before him for 10 minutes, he was conscious of a desire for a more varied field of vision. With a tremendous effort, he moved his head slowly to the left, and then his eyes bulged out fearfully, and his breath ceased and the rough-shod ends of his short legs wiggled and rustled on the gravel. For the old gentleman was coming across Fourth Avenue toward his bench. Every Thanksgiving day for nine years, the old gentleman had come there and found Stuffy Pete on his bench. That was the thing that the old gentleman was trying to make a tradition of. Every Thanksgiving day for nine years, he had found Stuffy there and had led him to a restaurant and had watched him eat a big dinner. They do those things in England unconsciously. But this is a young country, and nine years is not so bad. The old gentleman was a staunch American patriot and considered himself a pioneer in American tradition. In order to become picturesque, it must keep on doing one thing for a long time without ever letting it get away from us. Something like collecting the weekly dimes in industrial insurance or cleaning the streets. The old gentleman moved straight and stately toward the institution that he was rearing. Truly, the annual feeding of Stuffy Pete was nothing national in its character, such as the Magna Carta or jam for breakfast was in England, but it was a step. It was also almost futile. It showed at least that a custom was not impossible to, New <clears throat> to America. The old gentleman was thin and tall and 60. He was dressed all in black and wore the old-fashioned kind of glasses that won't stay on your nose. His hair was whiter and thinner than it had been last year, and he seemed to make more use of his big knobby cane with the crooked handle. As his established benefactor came up, Stuffy wheezed and shuddered like some woman's overfat pug when a street dog bristles up at him. He would have flown, but all the skill of Santos Dumont could not have separated him from his bench. Well had the myrmidons of the two old ladies done their work. Good morning, said the old gentleman. I'm glad to perceive that the vicissitudes of another year have spared you to move in health about the beautiful world. For that blessing alone, this day of thanksgiving is well proclaimed to each of us. If you will come with me, my man, I will provide you with a dinner that should make your physical being accord with the mental. That 
is what the old gentleman said every time. Every Thanksgiving day for nine years, the words themselves almost formed an institution. Nothing could be compared with them except the Declaration of Independence. Always before, they had been music to Stuffy's ears, but now he looked up at the old gentleman's face with tearful agony in his own. The fine snow almost sizzled when it fell upon his perspiring brow. But the old gentleman shivered a little and turned his back to the wind. Stuffy had always wondered why the old gentleman spoke his speech rather sadly. He did not know that it was because he was wishing every time that he had a son to succeed him, a son who would come there after he was gone, a son who would stand proud and strong before some subsequent Stuffy and say, in memory of my father, then it would be an institution. But the old gentleman had no relatives. He lived in rented rooms in one of the decayed, decayed old family brownstone mansions in one of the quiet streets east of the park. In the winter, he raised fuchsias in a little conservatory the size of a steamer trunk. In the spring, he walked in the Easter parade. In the summer, he lived at a farmhouse in the New Jersey hills and sat in a wicker armchair, speaking of a butterfly, the omnithera amphibious that he hoped to find someday. In the autumn, he fed Stuffy a dinner. These were the old gentleman's occupations. Stuffy Pete looked up at him for a half minute, stewing and helpless in his own self-pity. The old gentleman's eyes were bright with a giving pleasure. His face was getting more lined each year, but his little black necktie was in as jaunty a bow as ever, and the linen was beautiful and white, and his gray mustache was curled carefully at the ends. And then Stuffy made a noise that sounded like peas bubbling in a pot. Speech was intended, and as the old gentleman had heard the sounds nine times before, he rightly construed them into Stuffy's old formula of, thank you, sir, I'll go with you, and much obliged. I'm very hungry, sir. The coma of repletion had not prevented from entering Stuffy's mind the conviction that he was the basis of an institution. His Thanksgiving appetite was not his own. It belonged by all the sacred rights of established custom, if not by the actual statute of limitations, to this kind old gentleman who had preempted it. True, America is free, but in order to establish tradition, someone must be repented, a repeating decimal. The heroes are not heroes of steel and gold. See one here that wielded only weapons of iron, badly silvered, and tin. The old gentleman led his annual protege southward to the restaurant and to the table where the feast had always occurred. They were recognized. Here comes the old guy, said a waiter, that blows that same bomb to a meal every Thanksgiving. The old gentleman sat across the table, glowing like a smoked pearl at his cornerstone of future ancient tradition. The waiters heaped the table with holiday food and stuffy with a sigh that was mistaken for hunger's expression, 
raised knife and fork and carved for himself a crown of imperishable bay. No more valiant hero ever fought his way through the ranks of an enemy. Turkey, chops, soups, vegetables, pies disappeared before him as fast as they could be served. Gorged nearly to the uttermost when he entered the restaurant, the smell of food had almost caused him to lose his honor as a gentleman, but he rallied like a true knight. He saw the look of beneficent happiness on the old gentleman's face, a happier look than even the fuchsias and the optothera and Frisius had ever brought into it and he had not the heart to see it wane. In an hour, Stuffy leaned back with a battle won. Thank you kindly, sir, he puffed like a leaky steam pipe. Thank you kindly for a hearty meal. Then he arose heavily with glazed eyes and started toward the kitchen. A waiter turned him about like a top and pointed him toward the door. The old gentleman carefully counted out $1.30 in silver change, leaving three nickels for the waiter. They parted as they did each year at the door. The old gentleman going south, stuffy north. Around the first corner, Stuffy turned and stood for one minute. <clears throat> then he seemed to puff out his rags as an owl puffs out his feathers and fell to the sidewalk like a sun-stricken horse. When the ambulance came, the young surgeon and the driver cursed softly at his weight. There was no smell of whiskey to justify a transfer to the patrol wagon. So Stuffy and his two dinners went to the hospital. There they stretched him on a bed and began to test him for strange diseases with the hope of getting a chance at some problem with the bare steel. And lo, an hour later, another ambulance brought the old gentleman and they laid him on another bed and spoke of appendicitis, but he looked good for the bill. But pretty soon, one of the young doctors met one of the young nurses whose eyes he liked and stopped to chat with her about the cases. That nice old gentleman over there now, he said, you wouldn't think that was a case of almost starvation. Proud old family, I guess. He told me, he hadn't eaten a thing for three days. And so ends the two gentlemen at Thanksgiving. This O. Henry story is called <clears throat> The Purple Dress. We are to consider the shade known as purple. It is a color justly in repute among the sons and daughters of man. Emperors claim it for their special dye. Good fellows everywhere seek to bring their noses to the genial hue that follows the commingling of the red and blue. We say of princes that they are born to the purple, and no doubt they are, for the colic tinges their faces with the royal tint equally with the snub-nosed countenance of a woodchopper's brat. All women love it when it is the fashion. And now purple is being worn. You notice it on the streets. Of course, other colors are quite stylish as well. In fact, I saw a lovely thing the other day in olive green albatross with a triple-lapped flounce skirt trimmed with inset squares of silk and a draped fichu of lace opening over a shirred vest and 
double puff sleeves with a lace band holding two gathered frills. But you see lots of purple, too. Oh, yes, you do. Just take a walk down 23rd Street any afternoon. Therefore, Maida, the girl with the big brown eyes and cinnamon-colored hair in the beehive store, said to Grace, the girl with the rhinestone brooch and peppermint pepsin flavor to her speech, I'm going to have a purple dress, a tailor-made purple dress for Thanksgiving. Oh, are you, said Grace, putting away some seven and a half gloves into the six and three-quarter box. Well, it's me for red. You see more red on Fifth Avenue, and the men all seem to like it. I like purple best, said Maida, and old Schlegel has promised to make it for eight dollars it's going to be lovely. I'm going to have a plaited skirt and a blouse coat trimmed with a band of galon, galoon under a white cloth collar with two rows of sly boots, said Grace with an educated wink. Sutosh braid over a surpliced white vest and a plaited basque and sly boots, sly boots, repeated Grace, plaited Gijot sleeves with a drawn velvet ribbon over an inside cuff. What do you mean by saying that? You think Mr. Ramsey likes purple? I heard him say yesterday he thought some of the dark shades of red were stunning. I don't care, said Maida. I prefer purple. And them that don't like it can just take the other side of the street. Which suggests the thought that after all, the followers of purple may be subject to slight delusions. Danger is near when a maiden thinks she can wear purple regardless of complexions and opinions. And when emperors think their purple robes will wear forever. Maida had saved $18 after eight months of economy, and this had bought the goods for the purple dress and paid Schlegel $4 on the making of it. On the day before Thanksgiving, she would have just enough to pay the remaining $4. And then for a holiday in a new dress, can Earth offer anything more enchanting? Old Bachman, the proprietor of the beehive store, always gave a Thanksgiving dinner to his employees. On every one of the subsequent 364 days, excluding Sundays, he would remind them of the joys of the past banquet and the hopes of the coming ones thus inciting them to increased enthusiasm for work. The dinner was given in the store on one of the long tables in the middle of the room. They tacked wrapping paper over the front windows and the turkeys and other good things were brought in the back way from the restaurant on the corner. You will perceive that the beehive was not a fashionable department store with escalators and pompadours. It was almost small enough to be called an emporium, and you would actually go in there and get waited on and walk out again, and always at the Thanksgiving dinners, Mr. Ramsey, oh, bother. I should have mentioned it. Mr. Ramsey, first of all, he is more important than purple or green or even the red cranberry sauce. Mr. Ramsey was the head clerk, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm for him. He never pinched the girls' arms when he passed them in dark corners of the store. 
And when he told them stories, when business was dull and the girls giggled and said, oh, Shaw, it wasn't G. Bernard they meant at all. Besides being a gentleman, Mr. Ramsey was queer and original in other ways. He was a health crank and believed that people should never eat anything that was good for them. He was violently opposed to anybody being comfortable and coming in out of snowstorms or wearing overshoes or taking medicine or coddling themselves in any way. Every one of the 10 girls in the store had little pork chop and fried onion dreams every night of becoming Mrs. Ramsey. For next year, old Bachman was going to take him in for a partner. And each one of them knew that if she could catch him, she would knock those cranky health notions of his sky high before the wedding cake indigestion was over. Mr. Ramsey was master of ceremonies at the dinners. Always they had two Italians in to play a violin and harp and had a little dance in the store. And here were two dresses being conceived to charm Ramsey, one purple and the other red. Of course, the other eight girls were going to have dresses too, but they didn't count. Very likely, they'd wear some shirtwaist and black skirt affairs, nothing as resplendent as purple and red. Grace had saved her money too. She was going to buy her dress ready-made. Oh, what's the use of bothering with a tailor When you've got a figure, it's easy to get it a fit. The ready-made are intended for a perfect figure, except I have to have them all taken in at the waist. The average figure is so large-waisted. The night before Thanksgiving came, Maida hurried home, keen and bright with the thoughts of the blessed morrow. Her thoughts were of purple, but they were white themselves. The joyous enthusiasm of the young for the pleasures that youth must have or wither. She knew purple would become her, and for the thousandth time she tried to assure herself that it was purple Mr. Ramsey said he liked and not red. She was going to go home first to get the four dollars wrapped in a piece of tissue paper in the bottom drawer of her dresser. And then she was going to pay Schlegel and take the dress home herself. Grace lived in the same house. She occupied the hall room above Maida's. At home, Maida found clamor and confusion, the landlady's tongue clattering sourly in the halls like a churn dasher dabbing in buttermilk. And then Grace came down to her room crying with eyes as red as any dress. She says, I've got to get out, says Grace. The old beast, because I owe her four dollars. She's put my trunk in the hall and locked the door. I can't go anywhere else. I haven't got a cent of money. You had some yesterday, said Maida. I paid it on my dress, said Grace. I thought she'd wait till next week for the rent. Sniffle, sniffle, sob, sniffle. Out came, out it had come, Maida's four dollars. You blessed darling, cried Grace, now a rainbow instead of a sunset. I'll pay the mean old thing and then I'm going to try on my dress. I think it's heavenly. Come up and look at it. I'll pay the money back, a dollar a week. Honest, I will. Thanksgiving. The dinner was to be at noon. 
At a quarter to 12, Grace switched into Maida's room. Yes, she looked charming. Red was her color. Maida sat by the window in her old chevoir skirt and blue waist, darning us at, oh, doing fancy work. My goodness me, ain't you dressed yet? Shrilled the red one. How does it fit in the bag? Don't you think these waist tabs look awful swell? Why ain't you dressed, Maida? My dress didn't get finished in time, said Maida. I'm not going to the dinner. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I'm awfully sorry, Maida. Why don't you put on anything and come along? It's just the store folks, you know, and they won't mind. I was set on my purple, said Maida. If I can't have it, I won't go at all. Don't bother about me. Run along or you'll be late. You look awful nice in red. At her window, Maida sat through the long morning and passed the time of the dinner at the store. In her mind, she could hear the girls shrieking over a pole bone, could hear old Bachman's roar over his own deeply concealed jokes, Couldn't see, could see the diamonds of fat Mrs. Bachman, who came to the store only on Thanksgiving days, could see Mr. Ramsey moving about, alert, kindly, looking to the comfort of all. At four in the afternoon, with an expressionless face and a lifeless air, she slowly made her way to Schlegel's shop and told him she could not pay the four dollars due on the dress. Oh, God! cried Schlegel angrily. For what do you know to look so glum? Take him away. He's ready. Pay me some time. Have I not seen you pass my shop every day in two years? If I make clothes, is it that I do not know how to read people's? Because you pay, the sum, pay me some time when you can. Take him away. He's made good. And if you look pretty in him, all right. So pay me when you can. Maida breathed a millionth part of the thanks in her heart and turned away with her dress. As she left the shop, a smart dash of rain struck upon her face. She smiled and did not feel it. Ladies who shop in carriages, you do not understand. Girls whose wardrobes are charged to the old man's account, you cannot begin to understand. You could not comprehend why Maida did not feel the cold dash of Thanksgiving rain. At five o'clock, she went out upon the street wearing her purple dress. The rain had increased, and it beat down upon her in a steady, wind-blown pour. People were scurrying home and to cars with close-held umbrellas and tight-buttoned raincoats. Many of them turned their heads to marvel at this beautiful, serene, happy-eyed girl in the purple dress walking through the storm as though she were strolling in a garden under summer skies. I say you do not understand it, ladies of the full purse and varied wardrobe. You do not know what it is to live with a perpetual longing for pretty things, to starve eight months in order to bring a purple dress and a holiday together? What difference if it rained, hailed, blew, snowed, cycloned? Maida had no umbrella, nor overshoes. She had her purple dress, and she walked abroad. Let the elements do their worst. A starved heart must have one crumb during a year. 
the rain ran down and dripped from her fingers. Someone turned a corner and blocked her way. She looked up into Mr. Ramsey's eyes, sparkling with admiration and interest. Why, Miss Maida, said he, you look simply magnificent in your new dress. I was greatly disappointed not to see you at our dinner. Of all the girls I ever knew, you show the greatest sense and intelligence. There is nothing more beautiful and invigorating than braving the weather as you are doing. May I walk with you? And Maida blushed and sneezed. And finally, I have for you a short poem which was written by one Jack Perletsky. And it's called, The Turkey Popped Out of the Oven. The turkey popped out of the oven and rocketed into the air. It knocked every plate off the table and partly demolished a chair. It ricocheted into a corner and burst with a deafening boom, then splattered all over the kitchen, completely obscuring the room. It stuck to the walls and the windows. It totally coated the floor. There was turkey attached to the ceiling where there never had been turkey before. It blanketed every appliance. It smeared every saucer and bowl. There wasn't a way I could stop it. That turkey was out of control. I scraped and I scraped with displeasure and thought with chagrin as I mopped that I would never again stuff a turkey with popcorn that hadn't been popped. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone.